Like everyone else who's fortunate to attend this event, uh, my wife and I are delighted to have the opportunity to share in this birthday party and experience it. Uh, Dan and I first met as graduate students 57 years ago at Harvard. I was a chemistry physics, physics uh, student, so uh, after the first year in the physics department, I was way across the street, Oxford Street as you know, but I still saw quite a bit of Dan. We had two courses together that first year, one with Roy Glauber, who you all know, another towering figure in the field of atomic physics and optical uh, phenomena, and Norman Ramsey, uh, and had many uh, unforgivable experiences together. And in almost 50 years since, um, Georgine B, Dan, and I have had some lovely times together. Uh, a few years ago, we hiked for three weeks in New Zealand. But this is, in fact, the first occasion that we've got to attend a meeting with Dan because of a different culture of chemical physics and the, my first, our first occasion to Brazil. And, of course, it's been wonderful. Uh, I had some inkling that the field of atomic and or, uh, molecular and uh, optics it was a very, very family-like field, but that makes it all the more appropriate <laughs> here in Brazil where the family warmth is so strong. Others have expressed this very well, but it seems to me these sunflowers uh, send the message very powerfully as well. They are smiling on Dan and all of us, this big family, that are one way or another connected to him, uh, some of his students, some of them by way of his ideas. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you, well, I better click on the right button here, excuse me for a moment, uh, is a rather curious little episode, but I hope uh, some of you at least will f feel or come to think of it as a bit uh, amusing. So let's see, I want to get the slideshow version. Positronium, exotic custom of the hi cousin of the hydrogen atom. You know, it's a family gathering, we said already. Uh, many of the speakers yesterday and today have referred to how Daniel has taught them that the most important thing in the universe is understanding the hydrogen atom. So I thought, uh, since my experience with the hydrogen atom, I love it too, but uh, I've always made it awfully complicated for the hydrogen atom because it was interacting in chemical reactions with other things that are too complicated for physicists who like simpler things. So uh, what, can something be simpler than the hydrogen atom? Well, another relative of the hydrogen atom. Uh, the positronium just replaces the proton in the hydrogen atom with an anti-electron. That's the E plus. Uh, of course, uh, that's, as you'll see, kind of a peculiar thing to do because, as you all have heard, uh, anti-particles, as soon as they meet their regular particle, they annihilate each other. So you can think of this as an atom that's somewhat like a marriage, but between two dangerously antagonistic uh, people. Uh, more about that. Of course, uh, you all know that electrons have spin, and uh, since the antiparticle is the same spin as the ordinary electron, there's a choice of spins this way or that way. So there are two varieties, and we don't need to go into this detail. The important thing about it for our purpose today is uh, this major question, how long it takes for them to murder each other, that is to annihilate. And uh, it depends a lot on the spin. What we call para corresponds to total spin of zero, so that is the two spins are opposed, and it only lives for 125 picoseconds. A picosecond, I know there's some people who 
on sports pages have heard of a picosecond. The game was won in the last soccer game in the last picosecond, but it's a billionth of a second. Uh, sorry, it's a trillionth of a second. Trillionth of a second. Uh, the uh, ortho with the two spins parallel lives longer. Uh, I shouldn't have said uh, a, a, a trillionth for the peak uh, para because it's 125 trillionths. That makes a big difference, but still small difference in time from, by our standards, where nano is the billionth of a second. So a nano is a billionth, a pico is a trillionth. Okay, uh, then uh, why be so interested? Oh yes, I thought, of course, we have to make a comparison with hydrogen and positronium. Uh, a lot of things result just from the fact that positronium is a lot lighter, uh, a positron is a lot lighter, a positive electron is a lot lighter, almost 2,000 times lighter than a proton that the hydrogen atom has. So you expect some big differences from that. But also, the magnetism associated with the spin of the positron is much bigger than that of the a proton, essentially related in, inversely to the mass ratio. So the hyperfine structure, which gives all this extra stuff, I should be using a laser, of course, in this, if I press the right button, um, gives it much more interest, thank you, much more interesting uh, and broad structure uh, compared with the same scale with the hydrogen atom. So those are the, the bare essentials you should appreciate about uh, a positronium, this combination of a positron, a positive electron with an ordinary electron, compared with a hydrogen atom. Uh, now motivations for studying it. Uh, as a chemist, I'm quite intrigued <laughs> to see what physicists do. And uh, in particular, at the University of California, Riverside, David Cassidy and Alan Mills have a group studying for some time. I think many of you here probably are familiar with the incredible work they do. And one motivation uh, for many people uh, doing more and more with positron and positronium uh, is the fact that they can generate uh, remarkable concentrations of uh, positronium atoms exceeding 10 to the 15 per centimeter. Well, that's about one ten thousandth of the pressure density of molecules in the air here. That's astounding for such a thing. And it means that many experiments now can be thought of pursuing with positronium atoms uh, that never could have been imagined before. And they even have prospects, serious prospects in their mind, of slowing them down by laser cooling. We've heard a lot about that at this meeting. And uh, with the aim of trapping them and attaining, of course, both Einstein condensation, that has to be done in a great hurry because they don't stick around very long. They turn into gamma rays by this mutual murdering annihilation. But nonetheless, and this is something I love so much about physicists. Uh, you hang around with them a little and you realize how fantastic uh, are the things they seriously consider doing. At any rate, um, one reason that uh, uh, we looked at this is that uh, a number of people have already been uh, interested in the fact that uh, I'll be talking about uh, here, that in uh, super intense laser fields, a lot of things change with the distribution of electrons in atoms and molecules. And in particular, they tend to lengthen the time for any interaction between the particles. And we will see that it lengthens the time a lot for annihilation. And that's one reason to be interested in that. Uh, but the people who've looked into that so far with, with the question of the annihilation of positronium, have been so interested in annihilation, they didn't think of another important process that happens in electric fields, that is ionization. So basically, the story I have to tell you is that uh, 
My postdoctoral fellow, Chi Hui, and I uh, worked that out. It was an easy thing to do because it was completely parallel to the hydrogen atom. And we found a result which will surprise those people who uh, did the calculations and annihilation. So that's going to be the story. And of course, I have to keep a little drama. Now, uh, there's another domain I'm not touching on at all of super, super intense laser fields which go way up uh, to 10 to the 22 watts per... I don't know how, how to compare that, uh, but it winds up producing such high electric fields that accelerates the electron and positron together with GeV, that's the kind of energy you most usually think of in terms of uh, large colliders. So they actually discuss, these people, uh, of the positronium atom as a micro collider. It's about as small a collider as you could imagine, a single atom, in which the two pieces are smashing together so much that they can create other particle, antiparticle pairs. So it would be a jump from atomic physics to particle physics uh, in this one atom. So that's one reason for a lot of people have been interested in positronium. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to thinking about BEC, this plot here uh, shows you, of course, there's a correlation between the energy you need, the temperature you need to achieve BEC and the density. This is a well-known argument. It has to do with the wavelength of the particles uh, with, compared with the spacing, average density, uh, spacing they have in whatever density. And because uh, positronium is so much lighter, the electron in positronium is so much lighter than the proton that gives almost all the mass for the hydrogen atom, uh, you get a factor of a thousand. So whereas um, the BEC that Dan uh, Klepter and his team created, I think was about 10 to the 14 or a little above density, and so you had something in the micro, some, some say it was 50 or so micro Kelvin temperature. Uh, why for this, you shift a thousand over. So if you get anything like this kind of density, you'll get something like uh, 0.515 Kelvin. Even so, to do it, you have to be awfully fast because you have to slow down your positronium atom and trap it and get the BEZ formation before it annihilates. Well, one way that uh, people think of maybe making it a little bit easier to do that, not that it's going to be easier in any sense of the word, um, is to go to a super intense uh, laser field that, as I mentioned already, tends to elongate uh, times. Um, and that's going to be true in this case but with a asterisk, a big asterisk, you'll see. Now, uh, uh, quite a few people for the hydrogen atom and, and even us too for some molecules have treated uh, this domain of super intense high frequency lasers interacting with atoms and molecules uh, by what's called high frequency fluco theory. The essence of that, all you need to know about is if you have a laser that's so strong and driving so rapidly, uh, the electrons in the atom all get synchronized. So then the way to make things simple, theoretically, is to ride with the electrons. And then uh, the nuclei are moving in that frame of reference. And it turns out all the mathematics for the Schrodinger cream becomes much simpler. Uh, you can create what's called a dressed potential that's generated from that. It's called a KH frame after Cromers and Heinenberger who introduced that method. And um, it becomes a much, much easier thing to do. Uh, extensive treatments of this you can find here if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but that's all you really need to know uh, for our general uh, picture here we'll see that uh, when you do the calculations with this theory for short, F, H, F, F, T, it predicts for any 
system that satisfies some vi validity criteria that I'll mention a little later. Um, the ionization rate, that is, when you take electrons away, is going to decrease markedly up at the high level. That interests people very much because ordinarily you turn on a strong laser, you expect it just to kick the electrons to kingdom come. Uh, but no, they're so interested hanging around with that laser, which is driving them happily back and forth, they maybe get a little dizzy perhaps, I don't know, but at any rate, uh, they like to hang around the nucleus um, uh, just for old time's sake, or it makes them more comfortable when they're being driven by that nasty laser, perhaps. In the case of um, uh, positronium, where, of course, the, you don't have a nucleus, but you have another electron that's positive charge, then you're talking about the oscillation of the two. They're driven in opposite directions, of course. But this same uh, so-called stabilization is really an inhibition of the rate of, of ionization. Uh, so that was another reason I thought it was appropriate to mention here because you've heard uh, many references to Jan's great paper on the inhibition of spontaneous emission. Well, this is somewhat akin to that in that it's uh, in inhibiting something that ordinarily happens very freely uh, when you're kicking electrons out. And we'll see it also inhibits annihilation. So the interesting question is how much it does that for those two phenomena. So uh, i just show you for simple cases. Here's what the energy looks like. It's scaled to the reduced mass, which is a way of just allowing for the fact that you replace the heavy proton by a much lighter uh, positronium. Otherwise, to the lowest, uh, simplest first approximation, uh, the energy from the ground stated is the same problem as the hydrogen atom. So it's a good homework problem for students. And in this dress potential, it's almost as easy as the hydrogen atom thing. You see, uh, we plot it here as a function of this reduced mass times uh, something labeled alpha zero, which is the amplitude of the os quiver oscillations is caused that the electrons experience, in this case electron and positron both in the opposite directions, as uh, they're driven by this high frequency laser. Uh, so this is familiar units, atomic units that uh, all physicists know, named in honor of Niels Bohr, the centennial of the paper in which he introduced that unit naturally in solving the hydrogen atom problem. He would have probably enjoyed solving this one too, but it's, he's already really solved it. So see what happens is you drive stronger and stronger, this energy goes higher and higher, so the binding energy of the two particles gets less and less because it's this distance here, but it never crosses into the continuum. The, it never goes to where it would go if you were ionizing and separating the par particles. That still happens, but they have to be kicked off. And uh, that's part of why uh, the ionization rate is slowed down a lot. So here's what things look like. Uh, this, uh, I'm charmed that it looks so much like some of your <laughs> figures, uh, but this is completely different. Uh, this upper panel shows, well, first for uh, zero quiver amplitude, so that's the ordinary thing. That's what the ground state hydrogen atom uh, potential uh, uh, wave function would look like. But uh, when you drive it, say 50, uh, is that 50 or 40, uh, back and forth, 40 angstroms, uh, 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 Bohr radii, or 100, uh, you see that uh, from this frame, uh, you get two peaks because it, it, when things turn around, they stay a little longer in the turnaround. And so that's what it is. And those turnaround points get further and further apart as the laser is driving them. And this is for... Uh, linear polarizations for you're just driving right and back. The lower one is just in the ordinary frame of reference. Here's a circular polarization. Again, uh, that's in the moving frame that moves with uh, the two particles going in opposite direction. This is in the non-moving train. Now then, let's get right to the things that matter. Here's how ionization lifetimes go with the quiver amplitude, the all-important things. You drive them further and further 
oscillating apart, thank you, um, their lifetimes and the solid curves are for linear and circular for the hydrogen atom, and you see it's nearly identical for positronium and not very different, uh, this is a logarithmic scale, for, for posit sorry, nearly positronium is nearly identical with hydrogen atom, uh, which is a solid curve, the dashed one's positronium is not terribly different for, uh, between hydrogen. So that's easy to find out. And look at the t actual scales. They're very short. E even here is, is not much more than a few uh, uh, picoseconds or trillions of a second. So there's a big increase from what it would be down here uh, at, at uh, much lower uh, amplitudes of driving, but still, uh, it's still not enormously long. Here it is for annihilation. Here is plotted on this scale the ratio to the field-free with no laser uh, annihilation times that we gave you already. You saw they differ by a factor of 100 between the spins this way and this way. That's still true all the way along. Circular, again, uh, is slowed more, but you see it's slowed about uh, three or four factors of 10 as you get up to this neighborhood of the driving. It turns out a wave in this position, 80 or so atomic units, because a readily available laser right now can do this uh, with this system, as I can mention later. Now, here's the punchline then. Um, we're I should have stressed on the ionization thing that the frequency of the laser, this is in certain units that uh, are defined um, by, uh, in, in a way I won't go into now, but uh, th this corresponds to a laser which energy units would be about six uh, electron volts for those who care about such things. And it's about the most, uh, uh, the, the most highest frequency laser that probably convenient to do this sort of thing. And you see this, of course, is for linear, that's our curve. But in any case, the important thing is that uh, the lifetimes are much, much shorter still uh, for ionization than for um, annihilation. They, they're all enlarged by driving them in a super intense high frequency laser field, but uh, the, ionis the, the ionization lifetime is very much quicker. So we reached the conclusion right away uh, over a wide range of intensity and frequency and so on, this thing I just told you is true. And so here's a whimsical analysis. The uh, analogy, the positronium atom might be likened to a dangerously antagonistic married couple, as I already suggested, caught up in super intense social interactions, such as you might experience here in Brazil, as we've already witnessed, uh, that propel them apart far enough, on average, uh, to thwart their opportunity to much lower it, to murder each other. So that's really the line. It's sort of a gruesome thing to mention in a family birthday party. <laughs> I hope you might find it of some interest. Now, I, uh, I'm going to just momentarily say the validity criteria I should mention, the, uh, the frequency has to be high enough so that it's above the internal motion frequencies within. And of course, as you saw, at larger amplitude, the binding energy gets smaller and smaller, and so then it's easier and easier to maintain this. So that's one criterion. This other one, to um, correspond to uh, the sacred uh, uh, relativity theory and another approximation, that sets an upper bound. In any case, uh, we've worked out a little way of figuring that out and find this laser uh, will satisfy this uh, uh, with a frequency uh, it corresponds to 60 V or so in energy. Uh, you can easily calculate the corresponding intensity you need and that it can supply that as well. And this column here tells you that it's uh, 11 or 10 times, fulfills the 
the uh, inequality in both ends. So it's a validity criterion. All right, that's a little diagram that would work. So this comes to the end. Uh, the lesson that uh, uh, I think you will all enjoy is uh, this one, which uh, Dan and many other people here have emphasized. Uh, let's see if we get enough volume. Before you leave these portals to meet less fortunate mortals, there's just one final message I would give to you. You all have learned reliance on the sacred teachings of science. So I hope through life you never will decline in spite of Philistine defiance to do what all good scientists do. I may repeat that, but this will come to the refrain and that will be... <laughs> Before you leave these portals to meet less fortunate mortals, there's just one final message I would give to you. You all have learned reliance on the sacred teachings of science, so I hope through life you never will decline in spite of Philistine defiance. Do what all good scientists do. Experiment, make it your motto day and night. Experiment, and it will lead you to the light. The apple on the top of the tree is never too high to achieve. So take an example from E. She was our first experimentalist. Experiment. Be curious, though interfering friends may frown. Get furious at each attempt to hold you down. If this advice you always employ, the future can offer you infinite joy and merriment. Experiment. And you'll see. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I thought this might be a nice theme song for this organization. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, do we have any questions? Can you save for... Oh, no, okay. <laughs> There's always oh, a question. Oh, of course, Bill. So in the eventual um, uh, process of going to high densities and getting both Einstein condensation, uh, one usually relies on uh, collisions between the bosons. So what I'm wondering is, will collisions between two positron, uh, positronium right. atoms right, right. lead to additional uh, channels for annihilation, and will that be another thing that kills you? I, I would personally think that's highly likely. But of course, I've learned already that physicists aren't daunted at all. <laughs> Some sort of thing, oh, we may figure a way to get around that. I've heard several stories here already that I would have guessed wouldn't be possible. Well, it's just always nice to know but, what the orders of magnitude yeah. are. <laughs> yes, yes. We don't know them even right now. So it's a nice homework problem for someone. Or some ambitious graduate student might say, maybe this could be a chapter of my thesis. So. Thank you. We have another question there, and that would be it. I just I think there's wonder a question up there. Yeah. I yeah. Hello, oh, professor. Yeah, yeah. There, there. I just wonder: oh. is there any momentum exchange between your laser and the positronium in this process? Is there oh, a heating? Oh yeah, that goes into the calculations. Oh yeah. sure. And yeah. and uh, I didn't think we would want too much detail. 
No, I mean, is there we, a heating we, from this? We have a paper that I can give you okay. that has all this stuff worked out. That we sent it in a uh, month ago, and we are waiting to see whether the editor rejects on the basis of the last sentence, which is the one I quoted you about the murdering of uh, <laughs> Protestants. Uh, what, what is the size of the heating? Do, do you have an estimate? Or I beg your pardon? The size of the heating, how much, would you, how much energy would you transfer? I can't tell you right now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. Dudley, uh, I'm, I'm way over uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Since, since this is a Kleppner symposium, I wonder if we should consider the possibility of putting the positronium into Rydberg, circular Rydberg orbits as a way of making them last a long time. <laughs> yes. So there's a typical far out physicist suggestion by Eric Cornell. Why not make circular Rydberg orbits? Again, something that Dan, as so many people here know, showed how wonderful they were. And again, they are um, naturally something that gets celebrated uh, a century after Bohr talked about the hydrogen atom in such a way. So, okay. Sounds a good you. suggestion to me, a good, good thesis project, don't you think? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. My pleasure. If you'd like to say it's now or never.